maybe this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, maybe this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Okay then, folks. Um, welcome to Los Angeles. And um, what we're going to be doing over the next uh, six classes, there's going to be a series of six classes, and what we're going to do, we're going to cover everything in the course from A to Z. Okay. So when these six classes are done, there's going to be very little that you're not going to know about the Course of Miracles. So that's the first step in these six classes is acquiring the knowledge. Anybody tell me what the second step is? Embodying the knowledge. Yes. Application. Because the application is where the experience of all of this is going to come from. It's not going to come. No one becomes enlightened through thinking of becoming enlightened. <laughs> because there's two selves that we all have. We have our higher self and we have our separated self. Okay? And our task, basically, what's it, what, what this is really all about is which self do you want to keep? Because it comes down to choice. So everybody with the Course in Miracles is helping us to do it's basically a structure that takes us from here to here, okay? Or it takes us from here to here, all right? So uh, A Course in Miracles is basically just one way. There's millions of other ways of one can make the journey from here to here or from uh, here back to home from the physical world to knowledge, back to truth, which is heaven, which is God, which is uh, at the top level. So, um, really what the course is all about, it's about us now making a transfer, transformation, okay? It's about uh, relinquishing the self that has all the problems. The self that has all the fears, the self that carries the guilt, the self that carries the annoyance. See, if you're continuously trying to make yourself better, okay, what are you doing? This is the error, this is the mistake that a lot of people make. If you're continuously trying to make yourself better, you're trying to make your ego better. The thing about A Course in Miracles is it's about relinquishing the self completely, okay? And when we relinquish that self, the other self emerges, no problem. So it's the kind of, uh, what I have said, and I've heard many other people saying it is, we're all enlightened. There's nobody that's not enlightened. The only difference is, is what we do is we keep on enlightening ourselves, okay? So once we stop on enlightening ourselves, okay, the false self, the separated self, the ego self, just simply dissolves. And the moment that happens, it's like the caterpillar and the butterfly, the butterfly, or true self, or higher self, just emerges. So, but the ego, the separated self, the ego, is always trying to make itself better i.e. the persona. We all know the persona. Okay, so the persona would be the ego self-creating itself. It's trying to make itself a better... Actually what the persona is, it's the ego's concept of making the perfect separate itself. God created us perfect. We seem to reject that. And we came here and we're experiencing ourselves in a separated state, an ego state. And, I, and what, what the Course is telling us is that this world is where I can be a success on my own. Okay? That's what the ego is really all about, and this world is all about. It's for people who want to remain separate, want to stay separate, want to be a success in the world, they want fame, they want specialness, they want all the trimmings of the ego. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. You know, good luck to anybody who wants to take that on. All right? Uh, because you're going to have to find out yourself how that works out for you. You know, I can't tell you, you know, don't do that because it didn't work for me. But the only way that I found that out was that I had to find it out for myself. 
And that's what we all have to do. We can listen to what other people say and we can think, oh, that's a good idea, that's a great idea. You know? But until we actually do it ourselves and have that experience, we're not going to know that this world doesn't work. Are you saying we shouldn't try to become a better person? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. I mean, you know, uh, what I was writing on uh, my book there, we were covering it this last couple of days, we're on the sixth stage of human development. Okay? There's one stage left to go. Anybody know what it is? Neanderthal man was on the fifth stage. Homo sapiens come in, we come in on the sixth stage. And we have evolved over the last 40,000 years to where we are today. And the main reason why we evolved to that state where we are today, a civilized society, uh, people who are settled, is because of the persona. Okay, so the persona is a very useful and valuable and it basically makes the world livable here. All right? So let me tell you this little story first. All right, and it's the story of the two rooms. I told you it's the story, okay? Now, Neanderthal man only had one room. What separated Homo sapiens from Neanderthal man was the development of two rooms. So what we were able to do is we were able to now have an imagination. Neanderthal man had no imagination, he had only one room, so everything went into the one room. So it's like in our daily lives now, uh, Roy, you know, every day you get up, these two rooms, you have a room for everything you like, and you have a room for everything you don't like. All right? And what we're doing every day is we're continually filling up these two rooms, we're taking people out of the good room, put them into the bad room. We're taking people out of the bad room and we're putting them into the good room. You could be in a relationship with someone and you could be putting people, you could have the same person in the good room and the bad room a few times every day. <laughs> okay? So when the moment that we're born, these two rooms comes into our awareness. So the baby, the very first thing that hit it's thrust into a world of contrast. It leaves the womb, okay, in oneness. Inside the womb, there's no contrast. And the moment that the baby is born, that we're born, okay, the two rooms develop. And the thing that the baby puts into the bad room, first of all, is the light. Because the light makes it very uncomfortable. Because there was no light in the womb. There was no contrast. It was all oneness. So the moment that we're born, we're thrust into a world of contrast. And it's very uncomfortable for us. So what we do is we start developing these two rooms the second that we're born. So the light would be the first thing that goes into the room. The second thing that would go into the room then would be food. The baby either likes the food or doesn't like the food. And there's no way you'll get a baby to take food that it doesn't like once it puts it into the bad room. And this is why babies cry so much. Some babies, I worked in a hospital one time, and some babies just cry so much. And I remember now I have the pictures in my head, and I went in, and they were thrust under all these bright lights in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's what was making them very uncomfortable. So my advice to anybody who has young babies, especially for the first few weeks that they're born, have a nice mellow light. Because what happens later on, once the baby becomes used to the light, becomes comfortable with the light, now it puts the darkness into the bad room and becomes afraid of the dark. So the baby does this with colors, does it with sounds, does it with foods. So you can see now almost immediately how the body, our bodies, are splitting and putting things into this room depending on what we like, what we see, what we taste, what we feel, what we hear, and what we see. Does this make sense? Our senses. Yeah? So you can see now how the body is instrumental in this. OK? 
Okay, the ego made the body. And it made it in such a way that it was going to basically develop this world into both good and bad, right and wrong, innocent and guilty. Do you buy into those concepts, Roy? To some extent. There's things I like, things I don't like. I don't usually call things evil, but yeah. Well, then, of course, there's no difference in you not liking something and you absolutely want to kill something. In other words, there's no hierarchy of uh, illusions. There's no gray area. All right? The ego says, it's okay not to like something, but don't hit it. The ego then says, it's okay to hit it, if you can justify it. Then the ego will say, well, you know, don't be abusive. And then the ego will say, it's okay to be abusive, but don't hit it. And, you know, the ego builds it up, this hierarchy, of hate all the time. And it's built upon, built upon, built upon. But in A Course in Miracles, there's only two emotions. Anybody tell me what they are? Love and hate. Love and fear. That's the only two emotions. Everything else, all right, what's not love is hate. That's that simple. So, what I would like to do here this morning, we're going to start off, and what we're going to do is we're going to break the whole course into levels. If you don't break the course into levels, there's very little opportunity for you to have clarity and understanding of what the course is telling you. Because the way that this works is, you know, there's concepts at this level, there's concepts at this level, this level, this level, and this level. So there's five levels inside the course. And there are also five levels of separation. Okay? And everything is going to tie into these five levels and also these five levels. So what I want to do is start off this morning. I want to just talk about some of the language that's used in the course and some of the symbols that's used in the course. Okay? So let's talk about first um, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's say on this diagram, anybody tell me where the Holy Spirit is? Four. One. Four? One. Here? It comes to, to talk to us. It's the voice for God, so it comes to one to talk to us where the separation is. Sandy? Uh, I'd say four, two. You'd say four, two? Yeah. Any guesses, Roy? Uh, will be a guess. <laughs> I don't have a clue. Right. Okay, in this level, right. The Holy Spirit starts here and extends the whole way up. And another day for the Holy Spirit is higher self. Right mind thinking. The Holy Spirit is the right mind. The right mind, okay, is a thought system, and it's the thought system of the Holy Spirit, which means not holy as in I bow in front of you, but holy as in whole, complete spirit, complete oneness. Okay? So that's just one symbol to give you an example of some of the language in the Course. So here, in level one, we have the ego right mind and the ego wrong mind. We have the persona, we have the shadow. These are the two rooms that I'm talking about. Okay? Our goal in the course is to get from level one to level three. And how do we do that? Anybody? Forgiveness. We must go through the Holy Spirit. Because this is wrong-minded thinking, level one. And level two is right-minded thinking. And level three is one-minded thinking. It's the awakened self. This is the beginning of enlightenment at level three. So we have to go through level two. We have to go through the Holy Spirit. 
when Jesus says, you can blaspheme the Father and you'll be forgiven, you can blaspheme the Son and you'll be forgiven. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you'll never be forgiven. Why did he mean that? Because you won't be able to get through if you don't Because listen. we need the Holy Spirit to go home. We need the right-minded thinking to go home. So anybody, you know, it's like what you're saying there, Roy, you know, you know, about making ourselves a better person. You know, which is right-minded thinking. Okay. But the right-minded thinking of the ego is all built upon specialness. It's built upon me, me, me. What's there for me? What can I get? Okay? But the right-minded thinking of the Holy Spirit is we. 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 Yeah. So what if you're, you want to improve yourself and become a better person so that you can help others better? Mm -hmm. Would that be two or one? Here. Hmm. Okay. Why, why would it not be here? I don't know. Anybody? Because ultimately what we have to learn and one of the toughest concepts in the course we have to learn is there is nobody else. Mm -hmm. There's only you. Because as long as you, you see the whole point of this, this world here, physical world, is a world of separation. This is a world of oneness. We're all one. There is nobody else. There's no kind of physical or anything that differentiates us from anybody else at this level. It's pure state of oneness. That's why it's in bliss. You can't have conflict in, in oneness. Here, in separation, it's the only place you can have conflict. On the level of spirit, I can see how we're one. Yeah. But we still, our bodies are still separate. Mm -hmm. That's right. And of course it says, minds are joined, bodies are separate. Yeah. Yeah. So, ultimately here, you see the ego wants you to be a better person than anybody else. To help the poor, to help the needy. Anytime you have sympathy for somebody, you're here. Anytime you take pity on anybody, you're here. Anybody you time you feel the need, right? This is where we have to be really honest, is are you doing something to help somebody through pity or sympathy? Because if you are, then you're doing it through the ego. This is a very hard concept for people to understand. Okay, so you have to look at this, is this making me feel better? What interest of high is my ego getting better by me helping this other person? Or am I joining this other person because the both of us need help? You see where it comes from? You see, the ego is always trying to put other people down or put other people up. So that's the game of one-upmanship. Yes. You know, when, when the ego puts other people down, it's elevating ourselves. When it puts other people up, it's putting ourselves down. And we're doing either one or the other. In this, well, in this mind, we're putting ourselves up in the ego right mind because this is special, this is where we feel special. If we're in this mind, we're putting ourselves down because this is the mind of guilt. This is the bad group. So it's always very important is if you feel the urge and the need or the guidance to help somebody else, always look at it, you know, why am I helping this other person? Why do I feel the need to help this other person? Do I feel sorry for them? Do I have sympathy for them? And then now, by looking at your, your true reasons for doing this, is it a me or a we? If it's a we, it's up here. If it's a me and you, it's down here. Because remember, level one is the world of separation. Okay, and there's people here. Yeah. So then, if you're going to help someone, whether it's a homeless person or like an individual, or you're trying to uh, help the planet or something like mm -hmm. that, do something that's going to affect more people. Mm -hmm. As long as the difference. In th the difference to go between levels one and two is it just in thought where you see it as some as you being part of the part of it and feeling like 
this could be helpful to all of us and I want to do this because I don't know like we're, yeah. we're all in on it versus even if you're just helping a homeless person yeah. versus I'm so gifted or so lucky to have what I have I need to give to other people who have less yeah. right meaning like you're seeing them as not as as good as you're luck as lucky as you are well right. okay let me See, this is the world here. Let me demonstrate this little diagram, right? This is the world here, right? And in this world, there's three types of people. Okay? One, two, three. Anybody tell me what the three types of people are? And this is the thing. This, was, this is actually a very good question. Because this is something you need to sort out within yourself very early on when you're doing the course. Or any other spiritual work. All right, so the three types of people in the world, okay? There are those who are asleep, unconscious. There are those who are waking up. And there are those who have awakened. Okay? Now, what you have to say is, where are you? Diane. Which one would you be? One, two, or three? Two. You're waking up. Okay, so what you have to do now is make a choice here. Do you want to make the world a better place to live, or do you want to get out of it altogether? And uh, there was one of the analogies that I use for this is this this this, this world is like a, a house that's on fire, and you can turn around and you can arrange the furniture better in a house that's burning down, but the house is still going to burn down. <laughs> Okay? And in the course it says right at the beginning, don't seek to change the world, change your mind about the world. So at this level here, now and this is where most people who are doing the course, they're waking it up. Okay? And the choice that you have to make now is, do I want to make the world a better place to live? Or do I want to get out of the world altogether? Because if you're making the world a better place to live, you're attached to the world, and that means you're coming back. What keeps us coming back every time here is our attachments to the world. Okay? So at this level here, all right, there are people, and they're making the planet a better place to live. You look at equality now in the last 20 years compared to, say, 20 years ago. You know, 30 years ago. There's more equality now. People are less uh, willing now to put up with anything, you know, that could be seen as racial or uh, gender inequality. All of these inequalities are coming to the forefront now. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. The world is becoming a better place for that. So you don't, if you're doing the course and you want to wake up, you don't get involved with that. Because there are people who have written their scripts to come here to make the world a better place. And there are people who have written their scripts to come here to get out of it. So it, I'm definitely one, you know, I have no desire to make the world a better place. But that, to me, feels selfish on some level. What do you see? Here's the key. Yeah. If you're deciding to get out of the world, you're making the world a better place. Oh, right, right, yeah. Because you know what the world is in here in all of us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you're actually going to actually heal the world completely when you're out of it, because you look back on a forgiven world. Right. Here is the real world. So when we get through these stages, these first three stages, when we get to here, our last forgiveness lesson, right, is when we look back from the real world, okay, with forgiveness on the world that we made. See what I mean? So that was the ego coming in there straight away with you standing and saying, I'm very selfish. Because you think about it, if you're here and you want to get out of the world and not come back again, right? Then what you're going to be, you're going to be a whopping demonstration of forgiveness in everything you do. You're going to be a light that's going to shine so bright in this world. And it's going to shine a hell of a lot brighter than the lights 
here at this stage where people are making the world a better place. Because the more that we go up through the levels, the more we're going back into light, we're going back into truth, we're going back into love. So if you really want this world to be completely truth, once and for all, then the way is to use this world now to get out of this world. It seems like the more you wake up or the more you evolve, the, the more naturally you're going to serve. The That's right. That's right. That's so right. then you're number, if you're number two, you're naturally going to be more service-oriented yeah. than number three. You see, but the other thing too is this. On level two, right, there are people trying to make the world better and they're not doing it the right way. Isn't that true? Well, they're pushing. You know what I mean, like? They're trying to do it by force, they're trying to do it by coercion, they're trying to do it by basically manipulation, mm -hmm. i.e., you know, the churches for years, do you know what I mean, like, in, uh, especially my own church, like, you know, for 2,000 years it manipulated and kept uh, the people in Ireland under fear for, for 2,000 years, do you know, and look what that has basically did to all of us. So again, you have to be really, you know, the truest way that you can make this world a better place for everybody is basically to wake up. Simple as that. Because the world is inside our minds. So let's keep going with our symbols. So that was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our right mind, it's on level two. Knowledge is another symbol that you will uh, hear a lot about in the Course. Knowledge is at the top. It's a synonym for heaven. It's a synonym for, uh, for God, for truth. Let's look at uh, another one here. The last step. Anybody know what the last step is? This step belonging to God occurs when the atonement is complete. The last step occurs here. It's the real world. Okay? Is that when God takes the last, the last step, God, God comes in? Well, that's gets... only a metaphor. God right. doesn't do anything because we have never left heaven. Yeah. So it's only kind of because we're on our journey up here. It looks like we're taking steps and everything else. Mm -hmm. But this is what we're here. It says God lifts us back. The reason why Jesus put that into the Course was because of the Bible's version. That God's a judgmental God. All right, God, God's going to judge us when we go back to heaven, and only the righteous are uh, basically going to be accepted into heaven, and everybody else is going to hell. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's a kind of a correction. Jesus puts these little things in, and he tells us throughout the course how much God loves us and God misses us and all of this. He only does that because it's meeting us where we're at. We believe we're separate, so he's talking to us like we're separate. But later on, this is, he talks to us like that at this level. But later on up at the course, then he talks to you like himself. Mm. Okay? So, uh, another uh, one that Roy might be interested in is a miracle. Okay? Stan, do you know what the miracle is? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Diane? What's the miracle? The miracle and the miracle is this, that there was no separation. No! The miracle is in the dream. The miracle is required in the dream. The miracle is the truth that's in the dream. The miracle is forgiveness. Okay, that's fine. Okay? The miracle is any act of love. Right. It's when we look upon our brother and we we see love and not sin and we yeah. see them as ourselves yeah. and so you but that, forgiveness yeah but to get to that point is when we look on our brother and we see the guilt i see in you is mine yeah. that's the miracle that's forgiveness basically the error that i want to see in you is my error and the reason why i see it in you is because i want to see it in you and that is my desire. Anytime that we see guilt in anybody, Jesus says in the Course, it's always because it's our desire to see the guilt. So, what do you mean by seeing guilt in somebody? What does that mean? Well, when you basically, when you, 
let's say you see some atrocity. What? Some atrocity. Atrocity. Right? And you, you say, okay, uh, look what this person did. And then people label that as a bad person. Mm -hmm. That's good. Oh, okay. Well, I'd call that wrong behavior then. Yeah. Anything like that at all. Or it could be you're working with a colleague or whatever and you accuse this person of not working hard enough. Or this person of not doing their job properly. You want to see something wrong in somebody. Mm -hmm. And if you and what Jesus says in the course, he calls this errors. Okay? So if you see an error or somebody making a mistake doing anything, what you're secretly doing is you're putting your guilt onto that person to make yourself enhance your own ego to enhance that you're a better person. So basically judgment. Yes, it happens here. The ego right mind. Okay, always wants to see the other person as not being good enough, as not being uh, smart enough, as not being knowledgeable enough, as not, all of these defects are attempts for us to place our guilt in someone else. Okay. So the miracle is any act of love. Even, you know, Roy, if you were to get up there and I and I stand by the door, okay, and you're, I say you're coming out and I open the door for you. That's a miracle. You know, look at the many miracles you're doing every day. Well, then, if you're trying to help people or help the world, would that be a miracle or is that just. A... Of course. Of course. It's an act of love. But again, you know, let's say you're sitting here and you're a very influential person, right? And let's say you're very wealthy or you've got a lot, and I, I need your help or whatever. I open the door for you now. Is it a miracle? It depends on your motive. Exactly. That's the difference. The first time I see you coming, I have no projection onto you whatsoever. I don't, it's not that I like you, it's not that I don't like you. Basically, you are a perfect stranger to me. I open the door for you because it's the most loving thing to do. Okay? This is why we have to be super vigilant on our motives when we're doing anything. Like we were talking about earlier on. You know, if you're doing something nice for somebody, look at why you're doing this. How does it make you feel? Who's benefiting from this? That's all your shadow stuff. That's it. That's it. But if you want to be a more loving, kind person, then if it's sincere, that would be not, that's not shadow, that would, no. be, that would be number two. That's the miracle. That, or that would also be uh, right-minded. That's thinking. right. That, that's exactly it. That's the miracle. Anything that's any genuine act of love is a miracle. Mm -hmm. And the ego tries to mimic the miracles all the time through self-interest. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I'm going to do this for this person because I need, you know, I might need something off that person for that or I need this or for that or whatever. So it's always me, me, me. It's self-interest. And I'm sure we know plenty of people and look at the world is built upon self-interest. Yeah? So that's the miracle. Oneness is another uh, symbol that you'll come across. Oneness is here. Oneness is also here on this level. Here. There's oneness here. There's oneness here. So the oneness here is what? At the top, it's the oneness with all creation. All right. The oneness at this level is the oneness of Christ. It's the oneness of all of us as equals. So the two onenesses. We're one with all our brothers, and we're one with God. But we're not God. That's very important. You're not God, but there's nothing inside you that's not our God. And what that means is we are created in God's likeness. Now, everybody thinks, Right? And this is what man has done. Everybody thinks that we are created as bodies in God's likeness. What that was all about was what we did is we created God in our likeness. That's what the ego did. 
So we put a face and a big beard and white hair on this man, set him up in the clouds, okay? And that was us creating God. That's how the ego created the God. The God that's in the Bible was created by the ego. Okay? Because when we get into the metaphysics of the separation, you'll see why that's very, very important. The only difference between us and God is what? God self-created, mm -hmm. and we are created. Yeah? Can you get your head around that? Yeah, but how do we really know that? <laughs> <laughs> how do we know God was well, created? Well, it's in the Course. What has a beginning must have an end. But I don't think God was created because that implies that there's a beginning. Yeah. Well, we're going to do that. I'm using language here. Okay. We'll, we'll clear. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. Because this is only symbols at the moment. Okay. Okay. So, uh, oneness is here and separation is at the bottom. Two opposite ends of the spectrum. Okay. Uh, perception. You'll have come across this word many times in the course perception. So, Diane, what's perception mean to you? Perception to me is uh, usually my projections that I see. Okay. Right. You're, what you perceive. Yeah. Right. So there's two perceptions in the course. <coughs> okay. There's wrong perception, which is my one. There's right perception which is in level two. The Holy Spirit is another name for true perception. It's seeing clearly, it's seeing the truth. Wrong perception is of the ego, it's false perception. So when you're applying for forgiveness, you're perceiving correctly. When you don't apply forgiveness, you don't perceive correctly. Okay? So everything that we see, see right, you're perceiving either at this level or this level every day. There's no time that you're not perceiving either wrong-minded or right-minded. So your task is, when you're looking at perception, is what am I perceiving? How do I see people? Okay? Why do I see people the way that I see them? Who's, like, in the Course it says, ask yourself a thousand times a day, who do I walk with? Jesus says to do that. A thousand times a day we should ask ourselves, who do I walk with? Who am I looking at the world with? Am I looking at it with God or the ego? Am I looking at it with oneness or separation? Am I looking at it with love or fear? Oh, well, maybe this is too complicated for now because we're... Go ahead. But... Okay, like, if you ask yourself, okay, how am I looking at the world? All right, you may be able to say, oh, I'm looking at it wrong, but then there's a whole, like, how do you, in the world do you even change it, you know? It's like, you have to go, there's so much crap in most people that they have to shift through, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, you can say, oh, yeah, well, that's, I can, I realize that's wrong-minded thinking, but then. Yeah, so, remember, yeah. remember the two rooms that I told you about? Yeah. There's so much shit in this world. Yeah. All right. What we're doing is we're putting it in here, and we're trying to make the world a better place here. Okay. You can spend another thousand years trying to do that, and it's not going to change anything. Right. Okay. Yeah. What we have to do, right, is you get to here. Okay. That's the only level that starts out all the shit here. Einstein says you can't solve a problem at the same level where the problem is. Right. So the problem is here, and it can't be solved here. 
But that's what everybody's trying to do. This is the persona and the shadow, the right mind, ego, right mind, the ego, wrong mind. This is the ego trying to make the world a better place. And the way it does this is ships everybody that's not good enough, not special enough, not innocent enough, all into this part here. So in reality, we're splitting our own minds. As long as your mind is split, you'll always be in conflict. Here, at this level, your mind is not split. Your mind is one. There's one room. But unlike Neanderthal man, okay, when Neanderthal man had one room, he was unconscious. Okay? When you get to this stage, you're going to be awake. So you're going to have one room consciously. Okay? So the journey was we went from one room unconscious into two rooms unconscious into one room conscious. So here was the two rooms unconscious. Here we're moving into this, putting everybody and I into one room, and here everybody's in one room with us. Okay? Uh, the end of the lack of imagination. Yeah. Only had one room. Yeah. So how did the Anderthal man evolve into Homo sapiens? He didn't. Homo sapiens evolved in their own way. They were a different breed than the Anderthal man. You see, there was not only one breed of humans, there was, I think there was, uh, uh, from what I gather, there was up to six different species of humans. And one, you know, it's kind of like this world is uh, the fit to survive. You know, so uh, the Homo sapiens were the ones that were successful because if you look at this, well, once art came on the scene, Let's play. art, art. Okay, Neanderthal man couldn't stand outside of himself, right, and have a thought and think that thought that I had was true. Couldn't do that. You can't do that with one room. Okay, we needed the two rooms. So Neanderthal man was not self-aware. When Homo sapiens came on the scene, they became self-aware because you need the two rooms to become self-aware. But how did they become self-aware? Okay, how? Evolution. And what happened then is Homo sapiens thrived and Neanderthal man died out. You don't think maybe they had some help from ETs with genetic, with genetic manipulation. You think? I think they did, yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. No worries in that. Well, after all, wouldn't be the spirit what's really evolving. It's not really the physical form yeah. that would matter, right? So then, mm. I don't know. I'm just in reality, thinking that it's really the spirit. It is really the same spirit that continues the evolution. Through species. Yeah. 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 You see, when you have to remember this, right? We were not on the planet as such in conscious or form as Neanderthal man. Neanderthal man was an animal. There was no difference a Neanderthal man than a horse or an ape or anything else. Looked like a human and everything else, but it had no imagination. What, what the test here is this, okay? You have to have self, art, imagination, go hand in hand with self-awareness. Okay? Once Homo sapiens 40,000 years ago became self-aware, they started drawing on the keys immediately. They started developing a better life. They started sorting out stuff. You know, how can I make this better? How can I make that better? Started creating tools. Yes, exactly. Okay. Started planning for the future. Yes, <laughs> imagination. They Neanderthal down, man, they could live with each other. Yeah, Neanderthal, and they could work things out. But if you have only one room, like Neanderthal man had, like most animals do, like all animals do, you know, a horse or a bird can't step outside of itself and say, I'm a bird. A fish can't step outside of itself and know that it's a fish. We are the only species on earth that have two rooms. We're the only species on earth that are self-aware. Except maybe dolphins. What? True. <laughs> True. They are highly, and so, but they are. Some species on Earth that are highly intelligent. Dolphins, horses, dogs, cats, 
you know, domesticated mm -hmm. uh, pets and so on. Like, they have know? a little bit of self-awareness. Yeah, you know, but they don't have it to the extent that they could write a book or draw a picture or do this or do that. Mm -hmm. So that's the real, you know, leap of evolution here for all of us, that we really only came to this planet and started developing this planet 40,000 years ago. We haven't been here for millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years. We have been, been in the awareness, we have been a tree, we have been birds, we have been fishes, we have been all of these. Okay, but all of that existed in the now, in the present moment, there was no time involved. So you could have a, a zero on the scale of one to five. You could have a zero, which would be the yes. normal magnet. Yes, exactly. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a one circle, but it's a, you get, again, it's an unconscious one. Yes. Yeah. So you could go here, and you could just make it completely dark. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's a good answer. You know, and that was 40,000 years ago. Okay? So Homo sapiens... You know, this was Neanderthal man here, and then 40,000 years ago, then Homo sapiens come into play here, and this is the a spiritual evolution that we're all on. So oh. the appearance of one as Homo sapiens, would that also correspond with the uh, Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden? They became, they became self-conscious, and then they no longer felt the unity? That's it. Yes, it's a good way of looking at it. I like it, Roy. I like so, it. The experience of separation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but they have discovered, archaeologists have discovered other civilizations that were highly, highly advanced technologically that lived here hundreds of thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do you think they came from? Other planets? vibrations. That's what I would say. You see, here we have the physical universe, we have the spiritual universe, we have the higher universe, we have the real world and we have heaven, knowledge. Okay? But between these two worlds, okay, there's a level of vibrations. Right. Okay? Let's say, for example, your journey, right? You're leaving here down the physical world and you're going into this world. Okay? What takes you through here is kind of like a wormhole. It's a vortex of a higher vibration. Physical consciousness is very dark, it's very heavy. Okay? And it's got a lot to do with our thoughts, our belief in separation, belief that we're separate, the belief that we're a body. You know, fear has very, very dark and heavy, dense within it that keeps us basically coming back to this place every time. So the vortex comes through this. So between here and here, all right, there's a world of higher vibrations of other planets, you call them ETs. I remember one time, uh, it was only within about a couple of months, and I was having many out-of-body experiences after my awakening. And uh, one time, I was, I was basically my consciousness, not me as a body, my consciousness was going between here and here. And it was happening almost every night. But the problem was, there was a little guy and he hooked on to me, and he came with me through the vortex into here, ended up in my house. And he was a nymph. No, I never seen him physically, but I seen him energetically. <laughs> Okay? Because he was at a different vibration. Right. All right. But it was the most foul mouth little <laughs> kit that you could get your hands on. Oh, my God. And he wanted me, Diane was my cousin, and uh, we uh, we spent a lot of time at that time together, like, you know, and uh, he wanted to talk to her. And you wouldn't believe what he was telling me to tell her. <laughs> so I could understand immediately why he wasn't up here. <laughs> Do you know, it was one of these guys that was stuck between both worlds and he was just playing silly bookers. Do you know, he didn't really want to go through. Do you know, so there are people, I mean, I, I, you know, remember all my life and it only happened, I would say, about a half a dozen times, maybe a dozen times, I've seen strange people. 
What an surprise, you remember? And the look for me. Do you know what I mean? Like they didn't really stand out to be very different, but they just were something different about it. The way they were dressed, the way they looked, their energies and everything. Because I always seen a lot of visions. But it wasn't until I woke up that I realized who they were. They were dead people. Dead mm -hmm. people still walking? Mm -hmm. There's, the, the, people don't accept that they're dead. Right. You no, know, no. they carry on like normal. Right. They yeah. just won't. They're physically moving around and doing things, but yes. they're dead. No, no. They're, they're, they think that they're here. There's, they're, they don't know that they're dead. Ghosts. You're just talking about ghosts. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what is it about? I said you physically saw them. Yes. But they're really just apparitions. No, these were no, these were. You know, I didn't touch them, but they weren't ghosts, as in you would say, ooh. <laughs> you know what I mean? They were just ordinary people walking around. I mean, like when they cast a shadow when they're walking. No, well, I didn't see that. It was just basically you would get a glimpse of someone and you'd be walking, and you know, I always, you know, uh, look at everybody because I'm always amazed because you know out of it, you might see a thousand people but all of a sudden you'll just see one person and that person will have a light, have an aura, have something different about them like you know so I'm always you know looking you know what I mean even when I'm in the car I'm always looking at people and all of this like but these were people who just didn't know they were dead to give you a little story on this there's a, there's a website on Google and they've got photographs of people and they have one in particular, and there was this guy, it was around, I think, in the 40s in the UK in London, and this guy was killed. He was a minor, I think. And they had his funeral and everything, and back in them days it was a big thing, the wake and all of that. And what they had, they all stood for a photograph then. And the guy had just buried, was standing at the back, same as everybody else, with his hands folded. <laughs> in the photograph. Yeah. And it had been tested and everything. He didn't know he was dead. Yeah. You know, but we'll talk about that in the mm -hmm. afternoon. So, what we're really doing is we're trying to break down the course into these levels. We're going to be doing the separation, so this is why I have this here, to show you the separation. We'll correlate with this. But ultimately, you know, if you're doing the Course in Miracles, it's very, very important that you be single-minded about something. Okay, you must make up your mind what is it you want. Do I want out of here? Do I want to go all the way to the top? Or do I want to come back to have another life? Very important now, because if you don't answer that question for yourself, you're going to be in a state of conflict. But I, I think that we can, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but I, isn't it possible to, that with the mind, you really want to be aware? I'm, I'm only asking this because of what I've observed in other people, that with your mind, you, and maybe within myself, you really want to be awakened. You really want to awaken, but yet within the persona, with the unconscious mind, there's uh, some fear or there's some that doesn't want to be awakened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Resist resistance. resistance. Resistance, yeah. You see, the whole point of this is, you see, the ego's on a quest for enlightenment. The ego wants to wake up. It's not to get that part of you to wake up, it's for you to let that part of you go. That part can't wake up. Right. The separate self can't wake up. Right. The ego's strive for enlightenment is actually helping you, it's bringing you to a certain point. But when you reach that point, you have to let the self who got you there go. You know, if there's a part of you that want to wake up, don't keep trying to make it wake up. Let it go. That's the part you have to let go. Because okay. that's the part that's keeping you from waking up. Okay? Now that part, okay, has a big attachment to something here in the world. Do you know what it is? The body? Yeah. But uh, that was a rhetorical question, really, like, because it's up to you to find out what... You know, it's like, you know, there's a part of me who operates here in the world, who likes things in the world, who doesn't like things in the world, who likes people in the world, who doesn't like people in the world. Then there's the part of me who's going this way. So as long as I stay connected, attached to this part of me that has all these connections to the world, 
then it's the world and this part of me that's keeping me stuck here. And the only way that I can get to here is to start cutting the attachments here. Yeah. You know, to the world, right. anything I'm attached to, I'm cutting my attachments to the body that I have here. You know, and what we're talking about is attachments, Roy, we're talking about perception, how you perceive yourself. You know, how you perceive things in the world. It's the hunger for experience. Yeah. So, how do you know what you're attached to? The thing you pick, put most of your energy or attention on. No, it's the thing that's going to piss you off. <laughs> Anything that pisses you off, you're attached to. Anybody that annoys you, pisses you off, you're attached to. Cut that attachment. You have to detach from that thing or that person. And that's what forgiveness does. Okay? So, it should be very easy for us to do A Course in Miracles. Mm. All right? All you have to do now is be very genuine and truthful and honest about how you perceive and how you react to the world and your relationships to people around you. So who pisses you off then? Or what pisses you off, just for an example? When people tell you what to do, that really pisses you off. Yeah, really <laughs> she, she really So you have an authority problem. You really don't like to be so yeah. yeah, you have an authority problem. So that's one. Everybody's got an authority problem. But you have to sort that out. Who's the authority problem with? I'm so fine. Who's the authority problem with? Who do we have an authority problem with? In the course, you would have read about the authority problem. Everybody thinks we have the authority problem with God. We don't. We have the authority problem with each other. Oh, so right. we have the authority problem with ourselves. Yes. No, with each other. Yeah, with ourselves. Yeah. Separate. Yeah. So it's like this. Uh, remember when we were, there was 11 of us, all right? And then when my mum and dad would go out, there would be somebody in charge. And there would be all out war. There would be conflict <laughs> with our family. Do you know what I mean? Like, because no one would do what they were told. You're not telling me what to do. You're not the boss. And all of this, like, you know. And what was happening was, basically now, mom and dad, you could say, was God. They're out of the picture. All right? So that's what this world is here. God's up here, and we're down here playing house. And we're all trying to be in charge. We're all trying to see who's right, you know, who's wrong, who's better than you, who's better. We're all children in here. Okay, and we all are basically uh, have an authority problem with each other. So the way this works is how do you become one with God? Become one with each other. Yeah. See, in religion, okay, it's all about you as an individual becoming one with God. And screw everybody else. Okay, or maybe it is... It's about me and my religious brethren, my brothers, say, in Catholicism or Protestant or Buddhism, whatever. We're all going to hell. Can't be done. It's impossible. That's why I said in the book, the book, and I'm going to be ripped to shreds for it, no pope has ever set foot in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> You want to delete that from the video? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I've said it before, but it was somewhere very quietly. <laughs> yeah. oh, so, yeah. but, I, but it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek one too, because there's no feet in heaven. There's no what? No feet in heaven. There, there are no feet. feet. There are no feet. There are no bodies. Oh. There's no bodies, so when I say, you know, <laughs> it only pulls me up. Like, but anyway, because there's no single bodies in heaven. Simple as that. Okay. Or separate its Or it separate itself or anything like that. You know? So the last one that I want to talk about, the last symbol that I want to talk about is vision. Now, vision is not about seeing dreams. It's not about seeing anything with the physical eyes. Anybody tell me what vision is? Correct 
perception. Vision is understanding. True perception will bring you vision. So we go from here, here we're blind. I was lost, I was blind. Here we have true perception. Here we have vision. And it's not that you see anything with your physical eyes differently, but what you do now, you begin to understand something differently. You know, you had a, an aha moment there about five minutes ago, Roy. I seen it in you, right? When you went to, ah, you know those aha moments. You know, life or not. Well, in that moment, you had vision. Something just, you know, you understood something just for a second. So, the more vision that comes to you, the more understanding that comes to you. So, there's another. Some people uh, would call that insight. Yeah, yeah. Vision and insights, knowledge. It's all coming from knowledge. So, in the course, we're, you know, everything's an evolution going up through these levels. So here we're blind, here we're beginning to see correctly, and here we understand everything, we have perfect vision. Okay, but here it's our ego separated self that can't see anything, but here it's our higher self, our true self, has all the knowledge. And all this knowledge does not come from books, it comes from within. You don't have to learn. Down at this level, all our knowledge is learned, out of books, passed on, etc., etc. So the more vision you have, the more knowledge you have, because the both are the same. So, any questions on that? I have a question about these five levels. So, yeah. is, this, is this explicitly in the Post and Miracles books? These five levels, or is this your way of categorizing what's in the Well, the Course is written, uh, Jesus says in the Course, it guards us against level confusion. Okay? And Ken Wapnick, uh, who taught here in uh, Temecula, Ken would have taught these two levels here. Mm -hmm. Okay? I, I teach the three levels. Okay? So, there's five levels in the Course. Like I said, when you're talking about Heaven, you're talking about, when you're reading about heaven, you're talking about this level. When you're talking about the real world, Christ, us as one, you're talking about this level. When you're talking about the higher self, you're talking about this level. The one mind, oneness, all of that. Here, when you're talking about the right mind or the Holy Spirit, you're talking on this level. Here, at this level, you're talking about the world, the body, and the two rooms, the split mind. Yeah, a lot of different spiritual and religious traditions talk about different levels yeah. and teachings do correspond to different levels but uh, in the books they don't actually say there's five levels that's your way of categorizing yeah. it okay. yeah well actually you know uh, there's seven seven but because here there's three levels in this oh you see here in this world you have the world the body and the uh, split map so this would be the third dimension here Okay, this is the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, the sixth dimension, and the seventh dimension. What makes the third dimension the third dimension? Do you have the answer for that one? I have one question. Why, why is this world called the third dimension? Well, in, in conventionally speaking, there's length, height, length, and uh, time. Well, time would dimensions. be fourth, no? Yeah. Well, time is time, so height, depth, depth. Depth, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Fourth dimension is right. that's right. Well, that's what everybody believes. Is you what can also look at it, sure, body, mind, and uh, world. Yeah, that's yeah. like I said. That's the three dimensions is here. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what makes this the third dimension. What happens is, right, we have the mind who creates a body. Okay, let me... Um, what do I say? I'm finished with these three levels up there. Let me pick these out for a moment.
So what we have is we have a mind, we have a body, and we have a world. Okay? So the mind creates the body, and now the body, with its five senses, projects a world here. So these are the three dimensions that's in this world. You have mind, you have body, or sorry, you have mind, body, and the world. So the world would be matter, an inanimate matter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would. Because the body has a life force. Yeah. But there's no world inside the body. Because that's, you need the body to, to, to experience it. Well, the body is kind of like you're looking through uh, a specter, you're looking through kind of um, a lens. The body is a lens that the mind can project a world out onto. But you see, it's the body that makes the world real. As long as you keep making the world real here, the, real, the world will exist for you. Okay? So as long as you're playing with something, you want to keep it. It's not true. So Dan, as long as you keep playing with something here in the world, in other words, as long as you're attached to something here in the world, you're playing with it, you want to keep it. Okay? So for those who, you know, for those who uh, have made their minds up to don't want to come back here, then you've got to stop playing with the things You've got, to, you've got to stop giving attention to the things because you're really into getting, I want to keep these. So that means that you're really making a decision to come back here again because it's your attachments that bring you back here again. Okay? <laughs> But this, this idea of um, maintaining an interest in things in the world, that's all in the mind, right? Yeah. Form doesn't have to change. Form wouldn't have to change <coughs> yeah. just in the mind. Like just you could, mind. if you already have a family, you have kids, you still go about your day. You just that's right. That's right. Learn to detach from that. Yeah. So, on that note, that may, you know, what we're going to do in the afternoon, we're going to do the separation. Okay. And there's three versions of the separation. And we're going to do those three versions in the afternoon. But I want to read you this, right? Everything came from the thought of separation. Isn't that right? Everything began with a thought. So let me read this for you, right? This is how the whole thing kicked off. Each of us here in this physical world have three elements. Spirit, mind, body. The body is an effect created by a cause And that cause was just a thought, yeah? Bodies cannot create by themselves. They need an activating agent, and that agent is the mind. Although the body gives us the illusion that it does create, the body is purely an effect that has no power to cause or create. So what this is really doing is take us back into the power of the mind. The mind is made up of a collection of thoughts, ideas, and concepts. Thoughts cannot experience anything by themselves, although they can create and miscreate. The mind interprets everything. Everything you see, feel, smear, smell, hear, and taste. However, The mind needs a body to have the experience of the thought that the mind is creating. So the, the body is thought objectified. In what way? In the way that we can see it or perceive it. So yeah. it's objectified. Yeah. So what this means is we need a body to manifest the thoughts onto a world. Okay? So, every thought now needs a physical body in a physical world to have its own experience. Hence, the creation of a world to house a body that wants to experience what the mind desires, which was and is the thought of separation. 
This world is a concept that was made by the collective mind as was well the body and every other body you see and experience. Everything you see in this physical world is a thought that was created by the mind to experience itself in a separated state apart from true reality. So what that's saying is we had thoughts and we wanted to experience these thoughts away from here. And the way that we could do this was we had to create a world and a body to have those experiences. So, let me summarize all of this. Okay, everything you see in this physical world, all right, I read that. Your own personal body was designed by you to experience the thoughts that you have within your mind. Spirit is all there is. It is spirit that gives creative life to the mind which produces the thought, which creates a world to house a body so we can experience ourselves outside of reality in a physical world of separation. I will, I, all of these materials that I have here, I have a lot of them for this class, I'll be emailing them through to you. So anything that I'm reading out like that there, basically don't, you know, uh, you don't have to write everything down here because I'll be given uh, a lot of this documentation. So what that document is really saying is, right, we had a thought. And that thought was that we wanted to experience separation. And to make that thought come through for us, we needed a body and we needed a world. Hence, the creation of the physical world. But where did that thought come from? But this, we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> We'll get to that in the afternoon. Okay? Now, if I said to you, Roy, about the separation, what would you say? What separation? The sense of there being more than one thing. Yeah. But if I said to you about the separation of God, of all of this here, about what we went through, have you any memory of this? Not that I'm aware of. You'd be very doubtful of this. I mean, if there's a memory, I'm not aware of it now. Right. It might be buried in there somewhere. So how do we know the separation occurred? How well, do we, how, you know, this could be a whole bunch of crap. Well, there's a sense of separation now. Yeah. The most fundamental one is the sense mm. of self and other. Mm. But in another, just in a practical way, how do we know that the separation occurred? In the past, you mean? You're yeah. saying occurred in the past? Yeah. Um, we don't, I guess we don't. It could, have been, it, could have, it could have been there forever, as far as we know. How do we know anything to do with spirit? That has anything to do with spirit? Yeah. You're talking about two exclusive identities here. The physical body and the spiritual body are two completely exclusive identities. Well, you could also say, how do we know we were never, we were ever not separate? Because this is our reality now, so we would think like it's always been like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't remember the separation, but there's something in the separation that we do know, and we know it very well. I know that I'm aware here and now. Yeah. But we might remember the separation. But we do know the effects of the separation. The separation, right, was built upon sin, guilt, and fear. And we're talking about original sin, guilt, and fear. All right? So, all of these have effects. And you're experiencing these effects every single day. So, have you ever experienced grief? Anybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Where does that come from? Separation. Exactly. Okay. 
anybody ever experienced anger? Never. <laughs> oh, every day. <laughs> every day I want to kill somebody. <laughs> anybody ever experienced, right? Uh, hit. Loss. Loneliness. I read. Shame. Anxiety. Depression. Sickness. Pain. All right, we know all of these effects very well, don't we? We're experiencing them every single day. And it's not until we get to the true cause of all of these emotions that we can heal these emotions. Remember again what Einstein said, you can't sell, solve these problems at this level. You need to go to a higher level. And the only way that you can solve all of these, and there's many more here, there's a list of them here. I'll, say, I'll email this through to you, it's okay. But there's a list of them. And, you know, what we're doing is we might take tablets for depression, you know, might get tablets for anxiety, tablets for pain, we might, you know, shame, we might go and see a psychologist or somebody like, you know, grief, you know, most of the time we just wallow in it and all of this stuff. But what we're all doing is, you know, and everybody in the world is doing this, everybody is trying to feel, heal the effects. That's what's called in the course magic. Anytime that you try to heal an effect, you're always attempting magic. It's a temporary solution. You go to a doctor, you might have a headache, sore head for about a week. You go to the doctor, and the doctor will take the test, do everything, and will give you some painkillers. The doctor is dealing with the effect, is dealing with the pain. Pain is the effect. What is the cause of the headaches? You know, until we get to the cause, we can never heal the effects. Everything is going to be temporary. So what we're asked to do here in the Course is what the Course shows us, the Course takes us to the cause. And it's the belief in separation. It's the belief that this really occurred. Okay. So when you're talking to anybody, or you're, even if the ego's talking to you about the separation or anything else, you might remember the separation, but you know the effects very, very well of the separation. It's coming from a belief. So sickness is always about guilt. Of course. So every time I travel, I feel guilty? <laughs> well, you're attached to a body that was made to feel guilty and get sick. You have to remember, you cannot get sick. Right, only the body. Your body is getting sick. So how do I detach from the body? You detach from the sickness. How do I detach from Forgiveness. The you, forgiveness is, if you, if, you, if you took another word for forgiveness, put in detachment, that's what forgiveness does. Forgiveness detaches you from the ego, and it detaches you from the emotional pain body that you experience. So I forgive myself for being sick. Right. Now how do you do that? By, uh... Three steps. Recognize. What is the sickness? Guilt. Yeah, you're using it as a defense. But against what? Uh-huh. Well, what does the Course say? Sickness is a defense against the truth. Separation. Yeah, you're basically, by you being sick, you become so attached to your body that you become sick. You're so identified with your sick body that you're basically in total rejection of your true body. Now, one thing, right, people have been looking, and I have talked about this in a number, about the, say, the cause of cancer, okay? One cause of cancer, and I would 
you know, I might get someone to look at this and do some research into it, but from the guidance and information I've been given, right, that the cause of the majority of cancers in this world is coming from one ego two, passive aggressive. And the passive aggressive basically it's a defense mechanism, it's a coping tool where you hold the anger, right. the guilt right. in the body. And you have this exterior, calm, godly, nice person. Right, right. But the inside, you could rip the person's head off. <laughs> yeah, and that creates like a shrieking. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what's happening is all of this dark energy, this poison, which guilt is, which anger is, has been condensed in here in the body and starts attacking the body and its, and its organs. And that's why some people very quickly be riddled with cancer. Okay, it's because the energy in there is absorbing, it's been held in the body. We're just talking here about cancer, the cause of cancer is passive aggressive. Okay, because the passive aggressive by nature holds all of this dark energy inside. You know, they're like a volcano inside are ready to erupt. But on the outside, they're calm and smiling and everything else. But they could rip your head off. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, so we all know people like this. Like Suppressed this. emotion. Exactly. So the passive aggressive is basically one of uh, uh, the chief reasons why people get cancer. And it's there for the root cause of all sickness in the body when things go wrong. And it makes sense when you think about it because energy, the body is energy in itself, but the body is neutral. So all anger in the body, all guilt in the body comes from the mind be projected onto the body. But then the passive aggressive, right, holds the energy in the body. And I would love a researcher to look into this because, you know, do you know anybody who's really angry in life? Well, that person, I would say, very rarely sick. Because <laughs> what they're doing is they're projecting this energy all the time out. They're getting rid of it. That's true. Do you know what I mean? So I would say of all the people getting you know, cancer, most of them, uh, I have often heard in Ireland, oh, that person never smoked, and they never did this, and they never did that, and they were such a lovely person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. So, you can really look inside what, where the cause of all of this is coming from, is coming from the mind, and the effects are felt in the body. So, we're feeling the effects of this all the time. And if people, you know, don't realize that every negative emotion that they're feeling coming from, right. where it's starting coming from, right? If you don't solve it at the cause, it's always going to be there, right? Always going to be there. So it's only by dealing with the cause, sin, guilt, fear, this is the cornerstone or the belief system of the ego thought system. So we might remember this, we might know anything about the ego, but we know all of this very well. And we know that when we get sick, we get sick many, many times. Maybe when we're depressed, we get depressed many, many times. So all of these keep coming back over and over and over again. So what are the three things we do again? What are the what? Three things that we do. In... Recognize is the first Oh, you recognize first, you correct, and then you hand over. You release, let go. So you recognize that you've made a decision. Sickness is a decision. Okay, you've made a decision to be sick. Yeah, Whether you're aware of that or not is irrelevant. You can't be sick unless you've made a decision to be sick. Why would people be sick, you'd say? Many reasons. You get to play the victim, which is the chief. You know, does anybody know any hypochondriacs? Yeah. yeah. They wallow. Yeah. And playing the victim yeah. all the time. Oh, he's so, you know, the sympathy they get. But, you know, that's the, you know, from their perspective, that's them receiving love from people. You know, F people feeling sorry for them. You know, people, oh, you poor pet, you poor this. You know, to them, that person's, that's a drug to some people. Some people want to play the victims. Some people want to be sick all the time because look at all the sympathy and all the love and attention and the specialness that they get. You know? So we need to be very careful. Yeah, there's a great example. <clears throat> Somebody we know 
we were at uh, uh, another another person who's a healer, and he's he does really good work. And our friend Jody, who you know we know can see things. This person has a tumor, and this healer guy was working on her tumor. Her tumor, her tumor. and Jody actually saw the tumor going away, and then it kept coming back because obviously yeah. it's yeah. choice. Sweet. Choice. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was it. That's it. Yeah. So what you know, it's the motivation that we have to look behind in everything that we do. Do you know what I mean? If you're sick, is it a benefit for you to be sick? Damn. No, no, no. So why are you sick then? Anna? I don't know, but it doesn't benefit me at all, and I don't like the. But so therefore, who does it benefit? I don't think it benefits anyone except maybe my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it grounds you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the doctors make lots of No, money. who does it benefit? I don't know. Come on. End with it. The ego. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it has to benefit me on some level. The no, ego. The ego. Because it grounds you. You're separate body. itself. You see, you're doing a course. Right, just look at this one, right? You're doing a course in right. You want to wake up. And there's a little buddy stuck right here on your side. And its entire existence is dependent on you being separate. Yeah? And you're going this way, and hit, you can't take another step while it's here. So, what's the best way for you to pull back your foot? This little boy gets sick. You start now giving it attention. You start, you know, people start giving your separate self attention. Now you're back grounded in the world again. So you look at it every time that you maybe want to take a step here. Something happens here, and now you're back here again. And sickness, that's the cause of sickness, is one of the ways the ego uses to pull us back into the body. Well, it doesn't get positive attention. It doesn't matter. Here, positive attention, negative attention. Same thing. It just Same call. irritates me. Yes. But that irritation is keeping you attached right. to right. the separate yeah. self. So this is the motivation. So when you when I ask you a question like that, right, always remember, right, that you have two selves. Right. You see, if we drew a line here, right, and you put a foot here, this separate itself ego we have can't go past this line. Can't go past this line. Because what's past this line is light. What's at this side is darkness. The separate itself can only exist in darkness because it's dark. It's an illusion. You take the separate itself and plant it in here, what happens? Vanishes. Exactly. So then how do you get that that ego or that separate itself not to be scared shitless? How do you get it to just like, I don't fool it into like, oh, it's okay, we're not going, it's going to be okay, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not, put it like that, that this is, you're going to uh, go through a couple of periods where you're going to have great fear, you're going to be scared shitless, do you know, but again, that's what the separated self is, it's built upon fear, there's two emotions, this separated self is built upon fear, this true self is built upon love. So this is why fear can't come into love. And this is why love can't come into fear. Okay, so what we have to do, anytime you're feeling free at night, this is good. It's not about not scaring the separated self shitless, it's about scaring the, se the separated self shitless and then letting that shitless go. Because you, we have to, when we're going to do this, uh, I think it's in the next next class we're doing Know Thyself, we're going to do the I Am, and it'll be much clearer for you then at that stage, Sandy, how, how this is going to work, mm -hmm. you know. But ultimately in this, it's so important to remember always when you're having a thought, you know, is the thought coming from here or here? Is it coming from God or the Holy Spirit or is it coming from the ego? You know what I mean? You have to start a separate, a separation has to take place now. You know, we separated from, you know, we had, 
Our arms around God, we could say to use a metaphor, and we detach from God and we put our arms around the ego. Now, and that was a very painful experience for us. Now, what we're doing is we're arms around the ego, we're detaching there, <laughs> and we're going back to God. So there's another separation going to take place, and it's going to be very fearful. It's not going to be pleasant. But it's up to you how fearful and unpleasant that it becomes. Because if you do this, if you open Pandora's box, and you go through this process, the worst thing that you can do is start to procrastinate going through it. Because all you're doing now is drawing out this pain, this discomfort, this irritation, that annoyance. What I say to people, if you're going to do this, do this 100%. Don't do it 99%. If you're going to do this, get it over and done with. And this, can, this transformation can happen within three years for anybody starting from scratch to three years. Because that's what I have seen most people in Ireland doing this transformation through that. Okay? So, you're going to meet, this is resistance. Alright? There's a part of your mind that knows every word of this course is true. And if you follow and learn and study this course, you will be very happy. But there's another part of your mind that does not want to learn this course. Study it and especially apply it. That is why there's so much resistance to this course. It knows it's the beginning of the end. This is why we all hate God and Jesus. They don't do anything for us in the dream. We keep asking, God, would you only do this? Well, why, you know, why is this earthquake going? Can you help the people in Africa? Can you sort this out? And again, people doing the course to keep asking for Jesus for help. What we're doing is, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit are here. We're here. And what we're doing is we're trying to drag them into the world here. It's like here. God does not enter this world as such. Okay? And Jesus showed us the way out of the world. And what we're doing, we're trying to drag them back into the world all the time. By asking them, can you help us to do this? Will you do this? Will you do that? And all this. It's a trick of the ego. So, We do this because we want them to be a part of our insanity. And we get to keep this individual special self. That's the key here. That we get to remain separate and we get to have God, or truth, or love, or everything else come in. You can't. It's one or the other. It's separation or oneness. So everybody has a lot of resistance to this course. Okay? So it's about what you do with that resistance. All resistance is fear. We're going to stop now at 12. Okay, what time is it there now? It's five minutes to two. Yeah. So one of the, the reasons in the course, we're going to do the uh, separation now after dinner time. But one of the reasons in the course was uh, it, our motivation for separating in the first place, according to the course, was specialness. Okay? So, specialness only becomes a problem when it's denied. Right. Over the last seven days, where is that in your life? Is that, have you got, have you had a problem with anybody because you were denied specialists? Somebody forget your birthday. Somebody forget to say good morning. Somebody forget to wish you well. Somebody forget this. Somebody forget that. Look how annoyed, maybe, you know, if you were married to somebody and your husband forgot your anniversary, let's say. Look what happens. Wife goes ballistic. Someone forgets their birthday. You know, they get really depressed or annoyed or irritated or whatever. This is the specialness that we all give to each other. And there's no problem with the specialness as long as it keeps flowing. It only becomes a problem when it becomes denied. So you deny anybody who you have been used to giving specialness to, you deny that specialness to them, they're going to know in an instant. 
Okay, so it's important to know that. We all want to be special, unique, and individual in our own ways. And that's what kicked off the whole separation at the very beginning was because Jesus says, well, of course we ask God for specialness and haven't been a loving God, said no. But we took it away. Okay. Specialness is virtually synonymous with duality. The very term special directly implies comparison with another. So remember when we were talking about the two rooms. Okay? What makes the good room the good room is because it's special. With special people, with special clothes, with special books, I have special friends, I'm doing a special course, I have a special book, okay? I have a very special pen that I like to write with. So basically, everything special here. All right? And if anybody denies you any of that specialness, all right, we're going here. Right to the line it's as simple as that. So we have the whole thing set up in such a way that we already have the thought of specialness. I want to be special, unique, individual, blah, blah, blah. We have all of this in place. And now what we have, we have all of these people to give us the specialness. And anybody who doesn't give us the specialness we want, and here they go. <laughs> okay. And again, this is very, very important, all right, to understand that it's a motivation that we do. You know, it's like helping someone. Does it make you feel special? You know, what's the motivation behind this? Because it's the ego who always wants to feel special. It'd be nothing. So, specialness is impossible in a state of oneness or non-duality. As we have seen, there is never will be any differentiation at all in oneness. Therefore, specialness cannot exist in heaven. Specialness, therefore, is illusionary just as duality is. Almost all students of ACM fall into this web of specialness. Once one chooses to be special, there's a great need to defend the specialness and prove that it's real. Therefore, if one is to exist as a special person in this world, what better way to do this than to have a special script or a special life to do this with? This means that there is a special someone who chooses someone special to do this special work. So it's all about specialness. We all try to make ourselves be special because to us, that's the way that we can love ourselves. But what we're, you know, this is the ego. The more special that you feel, the more loved you feel. That's the ego. But in reality, the more special you feel, the more separate you are. You can't have specialness and escape fear. Everybody who indulges in specialness also has a lot of fear that they're carrying around with them. You can't have one without the other. So we should all shave our heads and put on orange robes <laughs> and change our names? No, no. That'd be special. That would be special. <laughs> because all you're doing is making statements. You know, you're giving yourself another identity. I'm one of the unspecial people. <laughs> Right. You know, yeah, that's special. But that's even special. <laughs> you know, so you have to be very, very careful with this, you know, and how all of this system works because the ego has been set up in such a way that the ego doesn't care if you're feeling better than everybody else or you're feeling worse than everybody else. As long as you're doing one. <laughs> all right, the ego hits it when you're in neutral. This is why the Buddha woke up in the middle way. Oh, yeah. Right. All right. You see, the Buddha didn't pick one of these rooms. All right. That's what the middle way is. Here's the middle way. One room. Down here, the Buddha led a life of splendor in the palace at the beginning. He went to the extreme opposite then of going into poverty and starvation with the... Uh, with the lifestyle that he led, he realized none of these worked. 
And what he did, he went back into the mind and he ended the middle way. And that's the task that we have to learn. I like what you said the other day where the ne Neanderthal man also had one room but it's unconscious. Yeah. And then when you go to level three, mm -hmm. you're, you're still doing the one room and now you're aware. Conscious. You're conscious. Yes. Conscious awareness. You know that you don't judge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just a small snippet, <laughs> all right, of general information to get us going. Um, like I said, anybody who does these classes, whether they're here or online, if you want links to this information, you'll be given links. Every, well, I'm going to give you all links to these videos so you can look at these in any time because there's a lot of information in this. You know, it's very hard to absorb it all in one sitting. So you can basically download the, load these onto your computer. I'll email all this literature to you, all the documentation. So you'll have a complete, by the time the sixth class is done, you'll have a complete kind of manual on everything, what, what the, the course is really all about. So we'll take a break there now if there's no questions, and when we come back in the afternoon, we'll do the metaphysics of the separation, and we'll do the mind, the split mind, and so on. Okay? Great. Well, thank you. Thank you.